Welcome to Stockholm and to this Nobel interview, Professor Thank Steven you. Weinberg. Um, I have talked to some of your colleagues here, and everybody says that you are the one to blame, or the one that brought light to the community of physicists when you wrote your book on cosmology in the early 70s called Gravitation and Cosmology. So how did you get interested in cosmology? I don't really think there is anyone who isn't interested in cosmology. If you go out at night and look at the stars, um, it's inevitable that you wonder what all this is. Uh, for me, it was a fantastic discovery uh, when I was a young professor, just beginning, uh, that there was actually a mathematical theory that could be applied to the whole universe. It had been worked out in the 1920s and 1930s. And uh, a theory of the whole universe, uh, it's something I had to learn about. And so I taught courses at Berkeley on the subject. And gradually, I learned enough so that I wanted to put it all together in a, in a book of my own, looking at things in my own way. You are, and you were then, also a professor in, of physics? Yes, uh, I've always been a professor of physics yes. at, at Berkeley, and then MIT, Harvard, and now in Texas. Mm -hmm. And how come you came into this field, into physics? Well, it started with chemistry. Uh, when I was young, I, I had a cousin who had been given a chemistry set. You know, this is a toy with chemicals yeah. and test tubes that you play with. And, and um, he lost interest in it. He went into professional boxing. Um, <laughs> Perhaps you should have stayed in science, but anyway, the chemistry set came down to me, and I loved it, especially that beautiful wooden box that the, it came in. I loved playing with chemicals and learned a little chemistry, of course. You always learn a little bit when you play with these things. I learned that all chemicals behave the way they do because of atoms, and uh, then I wanted to learn about atoms. And that was difficult because there was apparently a mysterious theory called quantum mechanics uh, that had been developed in the 1920s. And I read popular books by people like George Gamow and James Jeans. And I got very excited, not, not because I began to understand it, but because it seemed incomprehensible. <laughs> I thought if someone, could, still is, I would say. <laughs> if someone could understand this, um, you, you would have a hold on nature. You would be in possession of knowledge that would allow you to understand the deepest workings of nature. And so I had to learn about this. And uh, I, I had then, I wanted to participate in the creation of this knowledge. At a certain point, uh, there was a particular event that happened to me that was important. I was in a public library in New York where I grew up. And uh, borrowing some books about history or novels or something. And I saw on a table a book called Heat, a book about heat, and a prosaic subject, not perhaps very exciting to a young teenage person. And, but the book was open, and there was a symbol in the book that looked like this. And I, I had no idea what this meant, but I knew it was a symbol that was used in advanced mathematics. I didn't know, understand the mathematics, but I recognized that. And it suddenly occurred to me that advanced mathematics is used to understand something as elementary as heat. And it gave me a sense of the power of mathematics to understand everything in the world. Uh, Later on, I found out that this is called an integral sign, and I learned what it was. But at the time, it was just a magic symbol for me. And, but it showed that by manipulating mathematical symbols, you could say something about the real world. Not just atoms, but also something just ordinary like heat. Yes, so you became a theoretician. That's right. I was physics. always a theoretical phys physicist. Um, well, I was always wanted to be a theoretical physicist. Uh, although I started with a chemistry set, I've never been any good at uh, experiments. And you know, these days, you're either a theorist or an experimentalist. Uh, part, I don't think, at least in the kind of physics I'm interested in, no one is both. 
and I, I could never be an experimental physicist. I, I'm only good at theory, if that. Yes, but coming back to cosmology, the, in the 70s, the, this, as you say, it could fascinate lots of people, but this was not the subject for scientists. Well, it had begun to be in about 1965. I think the great breakthrough was the discovery of a faint radiation that fills the universe. It's called the three-degree radiation because it's the kind of radiation that would be emitted by a body that was at a temperature of just three degrees above absolute zero. And uh, this was radiation left over from a time when the universe was a, a few hundred thousand years old. And it was the first tangible evidence that there was a time in the history of the universe when it was very different from now, when it, there were no stars or galaxies, when the universe was just filled with uh, a, a cold soup of matter and, radi and a faint whisper of radiation. Uh, actually, not so. It's cold now. Uh, the radiation. It was not cold then. It, at this time, the temperature was about three thousand degrees. But um, this was um, uh, this was a great breakthrough in 1965, and it was trying to understand the implications of this in the period from 1965 until 1972, when I wrote my book. Uh, that was my main preoccupation. Uh, you have also written a popular science book on cosmology called The First Three Minutes, yes. which made actually cosmology maybe more comprehensible for general public. And uh, this was for more than 20 years ago. Well, what has changed since then? Oh, the field has grown so much. I, I think this is a golden age now for cosmology. There are observations of um, not only that there is a radio background, this three-degree radiation, but there are faint ripples in it that <coughs> give, it <coughs> give evidence of conditions when the universe was a few hundred thousand years old, and um, our knowledge is getting more and more detailed. Also, there's now much more evidence about how the universe is expanding. It seems that the expansion at first was speeding up, then slowing down, and now it's begun to speed up again. And uh, we have a theory, inflation, that describes what happened at the very earliest times, which we didn't have when I, when I wrote my textbook or when I wrote the first three minutes. So it's been a very exciting time in cosmology, much more exciting in the last decade, at any rate, than in my own field of elementary particle physics. So, so what would you regard as the most important um, observational evidence for the Big Bang cosmology? Well, of course, the expansion of the universe. I mean, we've, we've had that evidence since 1930 or thereabouts, the fact that all the galaxies in the universe are rushing away from each other. Uh, this, at times, has been questioned uh, as an interpretation of the observations, but I think it's more and more solid that in the universe, in this sense, is expanding. And now we know much more about the rate of the expansion and how it's speeding up and slowing down. Uh, that's the most important evidence, but there is lots of other evidence. For example, uh, the abundance of the elements. Uh, well, most elements are produced in stars, and that doesn't have so much to do with cosmology. But the lightest elements, about five or six isotopes, of the lightest elements were produced in the first three minutes. And astrophysicists can calculate the abundance of these elements and compare it with what's observed in the oldest stars. And it agrees really marvelously well. That's a, that's a real triumph, I think, of theoretical science. Mm. There's lots of observations in astronomy and astrophysics, but uh, your contribution was also to make people, element, elementary particle physicists, interested in cosmology. So well, there I hope was an so. Input Some people have told me that, yes. It, yes. But in the same way that I became interested in it, mm -hmm. yes. Well, what do you consider the greatest contribution that you made to these th theories or to science? 
Oh, well, it's not in astrophysics or cosmology. I'm, uh, I've written some papers in cosmology, but they're not of the first importance. Uh, my, my main work has been in the theory of elementary particles, and particularly um, in the unification of, the, of two of the forces of nature, the weak force, which causes particles of one type to turn into particles of another type, and the electromagnetic force, which people are familiar with, which is responsible for electricity flowing through wires or for magnets attracting pieces of metal. Uh, it turns out that these are both aspects of the same underlying force, which now has become called the electroweak force. So the, these were two of the four forces of yes. nature. And I've also worked on the third force, the strong force, in fact, my work on the electroweak force grew out of my work on the strong force, which is the force that holds quarks together inside the particles, inside the nucleus of the atom. Uh, in, in that work, I had developed certain mathematical ideas that go by the name of broken symmetry and shown how the, well, I had not originated the idea of broken symmetry, but I showed how it could be used to understand features of the strong force. And then uh, it occurred to me suddenly in 1967 that similar mathematical ideas would apply to the weak force and would allow us to unify it with the electromagnetic force in a very satisfactory theory. Mm -hmm. uh, other people, of course, have worked on the strong force and the electroweak force. And it, uh, out of the work of many physicist came in the 1970s a theory of all the forces of nature except for gravitation known as the standard model. And uh, This is the, the one that you have been awarded Nobel well, Prize uh, for? My, uh, the Nobel Prize came for the contribution to the electroweak force, oh. uh, not for the strong force, uh, where I, I was not, as far as the strong force is concerned, I made contributions which I think were important but that not, not of the uh, most important contributions. I see. There is still this fourth force lacking in, in the theory. Yes, this force, gravity, that yes. pulls us all down to the earth. And uh, when, the, when this will be put into the theory, then you will get the theory of everything? Well, I don't like to use the word theory of everything because um, it... When, when this is accomplished, it will not solve the problems of understanding the mind or so curing cancer not or everything even, or even yeah. solving all the problems of physics. We still won't know, understand physical problems like the way a turbulent fluid behaves, but it will be the fundamental theory that underlies all other theories. I like to call it the final theory rather than the theory of everything because it will end a certain historical progression toward deeper and deeper theories. Now, I think that that will happen, as you say, when gravity is unified with the other forces, but perhaps not. Perhaps we will then discover new things that require further work. Uh, we don't know uh, what is the crucial problem. I mean, that's something that sometimes isn't understood. Sometimes people outside of physics think, well, there is a problem, and if you solve that problem, then you will have the answer to everything. Uh, but very often, you don't know the pro what is the right problem, what is the important problem, until you're close to solving it. I see. But right now, it does look, as you say, that the crucial problem is to bring gravity mm -hmm. together with the other forces. So you have no idea when this final theory can be here? Uh, sometime between tomorrow and ne the next century. It could be tomorrow. Um, Just out of the sudden? Well, or? some very bright undergraduate uh, may uh, come up with a theory tomorrow and send it out by email, and um, it may turn out to be the theory, and we will all recognize it. You will? This I is think my question. So, yes. You will recognize it. I think it. so. Uh, it, it's probably going to be a theory that deals with structures much smaller than the elementary particles that we know today. And we may not be able to study these structures experimentally. But if there really is a successful theory 
Uh, one of the things it will do will be to explain the things we already know experimentally. We already know mass, the masses and the electric charges of all the particles in the standard model. It's about 18 numbers that just have been taken from observation. If the f final theory correctly accounts for these 18 numbers, if it tells us why one particle, the muon, is 210 times heavier than the electron, for instance, which is now just a fact we observe in nature, a mysterious fact. If it explains this fact and other similar facts, then we will identify that as the correct theory. Um, and as I say, it could happen tomorrow, but frankly, I, I doubt it. I think it's going to be the work of several decades at least. Hmm. Coming back to cosmology, there is a, especially one statement in your book on cosmology, the popular one, uh, the first three minutes, uh, that was cited and also discussed very often. Uh, you wrote, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little on that? Uh, well, that's not the last sentence in the book. Uh, if you look at the book, then I, there's another paragraph that follows that, um, that explains uh, what I meant. Although perhaps I didn't explain it very well. I meant, what I meant in that, that statement is that there is no point to be discovered in, in nature itself. Nature, there is no cosmic plan for us. We are not actors in a drama uh, that has been written for, with us playing the starring role. There, is, there are laws, we are discovering those laws, but they are impersonal, they're cold. Uh, we are the result of billions of years of accidents the, that have led to us uh, governed by laws of nature that have no care for us. I, but then after saying that I went on and say, said that if there is no point in, in nature we can make a point for ourselves. We can find things to cherish that we value. We can love each other. We can create things that are beautiful. And also one of the things that some of us find to give point to our lives is to learn about nature. Um, it, it's not an entirely happy view of human life. I think it's a, a tragic view, but that's not new to physicists. Um, a, a tragic view of life has been expressed by so many poets that we are here without purpose, trying to identify something to care about. Uh, even when we find the final laws of nature, we won't know that why those are the correct laws of nature. Uh, but although, for example, Shakespeare very often expresses a tragic view uh, of life, uh, golden girl, lads and girls all must like chimney sweepers come to dust, uh, our tragedy is a little different from his from the heroes of Shakespeare's plays. Uh, for Lear and Othello, the tragedy is in Shakespeare's script. And what I like to say uh, is that our tragedy is that there is no script. Well, we don't know it. Well, we don't know it, and I could be wrong about this, of course. Uh, I'm not certain about anything. But the more and more we understand about nature, we find no sign of a script written for us, and we have to write the script ourselves. We're, if we're in the position of actors in a tragic drama, it's a drama we're improvising as we go along. Now, this is really a fascinating topic, but I'm afraid we have to conclude now. So thank you very much. Thank you. For the interview.